Welcome back to the Ron and Randy's Audio Hour. Mm -hmm. I am Ron from New Record Day, and we have Randy, the cheap audio man. Yes. And how you doing, man? Fantastic. Thank you for asking, Ron. How are you doing today? I'm I'm doing so good I can't stand it. That's how good I'm doing. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, episode three, Audio Basics, Loudspeakers. We are going to be talking to you guys about loudspeakers today, which is yeah. going to be a lot of fun. Interesting title. It is. Absolutely. Um, well, if you haven't... Basics. Speaker Basics? Well, I like that. I don't... <laughs> have you ever... Okay, so you don't actually have a real job. I'm just kidding. Uh, so <laughs> legitimately, every time we're on a web conference or a conference call, it's exactly what happens every time. There's silence. It's so much fun. And then one person starts talking, and like uh, 0.32 milliseconds later, everybody else starts talking over them, and then they get quiet, and then they do the same thing like 15 times. And at that point, like have you ever seen the people in the movies just like, take one arm and just scrape everything off their desk onto the floor. Yes. That's what happens. I've been through seven monitors this year and we're only at the first day of February. You know what? I don't miss being able to work on my own doing hi-fi reviews and posting them on YouTube. What don't you miss? I don't miss conference calls. I don't, I don't miss them. Meetings now. Web 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 meetings with you are okay they're they're actually enjoyable no, they're fun. these are enjoyable no this, this the, is great microsoft teams <laughs> i don't care for let's get on teams hold on yeah start, start a team meeting can you share my screen can you see my screen are you seeing my screen now <laughs> uh 2020 and 2021 when will it end i don't know probably don't december know. 31st Probably December 31st. That's my guess. I don't know. I could be wrong. I got a question for you, buddy. Yeah. What is new in your audio world? What's going on over there at the Cheap Audio Man LLC Incorporated? It's a limited <laughs> partnership. Thank you very much. <laughs> LPC. Um, like as far as like gear that I'm reviewing or... Yeah, shows. I, I'm very diversified over here, Ron. I've got a lot of different segments. You know, we're working on a little thing. We're starting up a reality TV show uh, with goats and the kids. I feel like I use goats too much, but no, we need works. more goats. Yeah, the fainting goats. You scare them, <laughs> and then they fall over, and the kids <laughs> laugh and point. <laughs> no, I got a whole bunch of stuff, man. I've got the schedule all filled out for the rest of. February into mm. the mid March. I've got, ooh, by the time this goes up, the Warfadale Diamond 12.2 review will have gone up prior to. Early impressions? Are you, you going to talk about those guys at all? Give a little nugget? Spoiler alert. They're quite nice. Mm. Yeah, I like them. I'm not going to mm. go into details, but they're good. I think that is that them behind your shoulder there. Is that I think I see them, or is that the Yamos? That's no, them. Those are, that's the Warfies, Warfie yeah. Dailies. Um, so I like to call them. Here, hold on. What's what's see. what's the price point on those bad boys? Five hundred for the pair. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So for for the woofer. For. <laughs> you have to put them together. They send it's in a kit, but it's in five different boxes. Um, I, they're, no, they're, uh, 500 for the pair. They come in a variety of colors. Yeah. Flashlight. Very cool. There Let's see. There we go. Look at that. There we go. They have a there it is. shiny baffle and a tweeter and a woofer. You get both this time. Well, since I'm we're going to be talking about speakers today, folks, that would be considered a what? A two-way so, yeah. Loudspeaker. Oh. Yeah. CAF Q350s. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ooh. Fluence reference towers. They're big. Mm. They're bad. They're mm. the C Canadian giant. 
coming down here mm. and spend a little time in the USNA. Um, we have, well, we have that whole Fluence 5 channel over here. S, uh, SVS SB1000 subwoofer, 12 inch sealed. SVS sound base, streaming amplifier, topping MX3. You're a busy guy. Vista Audio Spark. We got a whole bunch of stuff. Wow. Wow. I, ooh, Zendak. Zendak. Yeah. Yeah, we'll Can't forget sure. the old Zendak. You did a nice video on the Zen Blue. I still use it. I have it on the ground collecting dust somewhere. Yeah, I still use it every now and then. It's great. Yeah. I dig I'm it. I'm pretty impressed. I got one for my brother uh, as a Father's Day gift, and he uses it often. All all the time, actually. He like exclusively the uses the, that. Uh, like the portable deck. The blue, the Zen blue. The uh, it's a streamer DAC, a little bit of all in one. Has a, has a Bluetooth receiver. It is, but it does have a DAC. And what's cool about it, Randy, and this was one of the things that I highlighted in my review, is on the back you can either switch it to digital or analog. And so, so right if you switch it to analog, you're back. using exactly. Pretty clever. Yeah. Those guys that I fight, they're pretty clever. They're, it, I don't want to ruin it, but man. Did it? I, I don't want to ruin it. I shouldn't <laughs> like it as much as I do, but I do. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to get into it, though. I'll wait for wait for the review. How much is the uh, is that little guy? $130. $129. It's getting to a point where you have to ask, how did you do that? I mean, that's just not, that's well, not, not a ton of that. money. It's not just a DAC. It's a like a headphone amp, so balanced Mother, headphone amp. We are gonna, um, <laughs> I'm a dad. Hold on. No, I get it, buddy. Look at that precious little child. I have him too. Check out the uh, Steve Gutenberg between two speakers. It was a lot of fun. Uh, Steve and I chit chatted for a while about aliens and. Jimi Hendrix dropping Bluetooth headphones off of a tall skyscraper in Manhattan. Ron's getting a Mai Tai. He's day drinking. Yeah, Ron, I'm, I just uh, I let everybody in on your, your little secret about you day drinking. About me day drinking? This is a Mai Tai from BlackRock? Mm -hmm. Daddy, I found one of my crinkly shirts. Yeah. Oh man, that's awesome, buddy. All right, Daddy's gonna finish with. No, I mean, go back to his podcast, where okay? Is it? It's over there, Ron. Right, where is it? Did she get a drink? Pizza. She did. No, we Pizza. we try we try to do that on special occasions, but not all the time. What like a Georgia sugar? does not Georgia does not need sugar. I can tell you that. She's she's peppy. Yeah, she'll get you. <laughs> I uh, I bring home Monster Energy drinks for the girls and let them drink them, and then run around and I leave. <laughs> that is a terrible, we'll terrible you, idea. A <laughs> terrible idea. Uh, <laughs> text me. I I'm turning my phone off though. Sorry for the interruption. What where, what did I miss? What did what 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 were we talking about? Well, I said I did it between two speakers with old Steve Gutenberg. Mister Gutenberg. Gutenberg. Funny. It was a blast. Funny. It was so much fun. It was way fun, funner than yours. I I completely agree. Um, the rapid fire questions were brilliant. It was great. Well, they and weren't his... in real time. I don't know if you could tell that they were edited. You did a good job. I think you were telling me that that video was initially like an hour long. It was so long, Bron. <laughs> you look tired, buddy. Do you need I a Mai Tai? Tired. There's no, got, just an energy drink. Actually, I okay. have coffee and soda. Oh, mm -hmm. double fist in it today. All right, this man. This might be a little ripe, though, because this is from this morning. You cracked me up in your, uh, I think it was in your Prime review, the way that you hold your sodas. You like do like a little. That's because I don't know if I'm like breaking any type of trade law. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. You might do, be. So I don't always know what to do with my hands, so I just did it. Yeah, there you go. Who knows what he's drinking? Don't know. It's a Coke Zero. Coke Zero. All right. So you've gone over your what, do you what got over is there new. 
in in uh, in R and R podcast West, the you know the headquarters HQ the West. head HQ West. Um, I'm gonna be doing a video this week on. It's a little weird. It's a little unusual. This is a demo speaker, do-it-yourself demo speaker that a company put together to kind of show off what their woofer is capable of. And that is through a company called Purify. If you are familiar with uh, Bruno, I can't say his last name, Bruno Mars, Pete, that's it, Bruno Mars, um, world-class designer uh, with amplification. He started Encore or Hypex, excuse me, and then now he's doing Purify. The guy is no joke, and he has designed so this woofer. he made amplifiers, and now he's making speaker drivers? Drivers and still amplifiers based on everything that he learned with what he did with Hypex. Yes, that is true. So and so they like, sent me. Look at me. Look at me. I'm Bruno. Um, so I have their uh, amplifier. Again, behind me somewhere collecting dust and then the speakers and so that will be uh the video this week and it is the most gnarly looking woofer you will ever see it's it looks like a fried egg gone bad is the way i would try to describe it so it's not like repeatable it's yeah the surround the surround of the woofer has some ridges that are going inwards and outwards and when you look at it it just it's like wow what happened to that so does it like it's interesting material made out of it's a paper cone driver um ron likes those i do i do and we'll be talking about that today we should be talking about that today segue what a great segue so uh should we just dive in? I don't know. Is there water in the pool? I, I think there's water in the pool. If there's not water in the pool. So a lot of different types of loudspeakers. We can't possibly cover them all in detail on this podcast, but we're going to do the best that we can of, I guess, just covering some of the basics. Yeah. Is that my turn to talk or what? You got all quiet. Go for it. I... I I've told Randy this a number of times that I just feel like a chatty Kathy. Like it's all about me on this. So I'm going to let you talk a little bit more. I just want to make sure you have nothing to say. All right. Well, but speakers, uh, but well, you got a box that uh, it, <laughs> you got some drivers, you got some internal wiring, you got your crossover, which is a collection of capacitors, inductors, resistors thrown together and, magic ways that make the music sound fun now basically crossover putting the low frequencies down to the woofer or mid bass driver whatever it is high frequencies up to the uh, tweeter sometimes you have even higher frequencies going up to the super tweeter there's a variety of things you got holes in them it's called a ported one sometimes you have it sealed up no ports sometimes you have a passive radiator all sorts of coolness bracing you can put bed toppers inside there to absorb sound that's it i th- i think we're done here yeah. i think that's some we'll i think that sums week, it up everybody we'll see you guys <laughs> this will be our last podcast we appreciate <laughs> <laughs> it's so good everyone's gleaning so much valuable information from us Let's talk, um, before we get into like a two-way, which you actually just perfectly illustrated, um, let's start with the most simple form of a speaker that I know of, which would be a wideband driver. Full range? Full range. Full range. Wideband. Full range. Often considered point source, which would mean that everything is coming from one location. Yeah. Um. Wideband drivers, uh, we do see often in the hi-fi sector, and they do seem to have a pretty big fan base. There's a lot of folks that believe that that is the most pure way of hearing music is from one speaker 
that is doing everything. And Can you give me like a example of manufacturers that do that. Um, there's going to be some boutique stuff out there, and I, the the, the reality is, is, it's not my cup of tea, so I'm not well versed in a lot of the manufacturers that that offer those because it's just not something that I tend to. Um, I'm drawing a blank right now of thinking a, of a specific manufacturer that does wideband offerings, but Voxative is one. They're in Germany. And really high-end stuff, really expensive drivers, and almost all are based on the theory of like a wideband type of a driver. Often you'll see a wizard cone or a phase plug on the wideband driver to help with some of the complications that you end up with when you have a wideband driver. Mm -hmm. Um, but that would be one, uh, there's going to be some hybrids that we can discuss that would be like leaning in the direction of companies like zoo audio, where there, a lot of their woofers are indeed a wide band driver, but then they are also throwing in a tweeter to Mm -hmm. help with extension. Yeah. So before we like tackle that, I think a good place to start. Um, just to kind of briefly chat about wideband is what are the pros? Like if we were to sit back and say, okay, setting aside our own bias, what would be the advantage or pros to a wideband driver? Any guesses on that one, bro? Yeah, well, you don't have any phase issues, right? Or I guess you could have phase issues, but it's all coming from the same source. You don't have to worry about like vertical offset or even horizontal offset, right? It's just coming from one thing. So I would imagine that the sound imaging is probably can be very good and sound staging. Obviously, there's no tweeter to bring attention to itself. So I don't know. Maybe that's my guess. Is that accurate, Ron? You did. Ron. You did a good job. Um, I think that one of the things that I've noticed after spending a little bit of time with some wideband drivers, one thing that I noticed that I would say is a positive attribute to them is for the frequencies that they are capable of playing, it is cohesive. And that would be the word that I would always come back to is it's almost as if there is no way for it not to be cohesive. That if the speaker is playing in the frequencies that it is designed to play and it's playing them without any, you know, crazy distortion or breakup modes, things like that, then you are left with, a very cohesive type of a sound, which is, that's a good thing. Explain what cohesive means, like I'm seven. Yeah. Okay. So this, we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get into two ways, but in a crossover, you have a woofer and you have a tweeter, and you're essentially trying to make these two shake hands. And the relationship between that woofer and that tweeter is handled through the use of a crossover. And so... The phase relationship or the relationship of those two drivers is critical. And if they're shaking hands and they're shaking hands well, then you build a bridge from one driver to the next. Now, um, with that being said, it is still tricky to make that all sound perfectly linear, the same, or cohesive. That's not always easy to do. And I think that's what, in my opinion, separates the greats from the pretty goods, right? Um, whereas if we're talking about a driver that is, there is no need for it to cross higher or lower to something else. It's just playing whatever it is receiving. Then by nature, it, it kind of has to be cohesive. Now, that is not to be confused with linear. That just means that whatever is being played out of the speaker is at least going to be a cohesive presentation. Gotcha. So, like, what's the frequency response on these things? Glad you asked, my friend, because this is where we get into trouble. And this would be, I think, a fair and reasonable um, con or argument against the idea of a wideband driver. Because a wideband driver has to get low and it has to play high, it's trying to play as much of a broadband frequency as possible, we are talking about a woofer that is trying to act like a woofer, so being dynamic and moving air and trying to deal with sound pressure, 
And then as it gets higher in frequencies, as the wavelengths get, you know, shorter, it is a transition of not so much sound pressure, but a stiffening type of um, response that the woofer would need to handle. So is the woofer able to deal with that type of frequency before it says, no, I, I can't do that. And so what we often see, if not always see, is indicative of the woofer side of the, of the wideband driver is at some point we will see a what is called a breakup mode. Is that when it goes like this? It's when it goes like this. It's, yeah. it's in, uh-uh. It's when whatever the material is is saying, I can't do that whether it be paper cone or I the likes go for that. No, uh, no can do no can do. And that is a, um, that is the reason why we often see different materials being used, not always, but often see different materials being used in tweeters than we do woofers because the job that it is trying to do requires different materials in order to play those higher frequencies without, dying without saying no more segue i think good segue tweeter common tweeter materials of construction or did i just throw a monkey wrench into your into your podcast you did not did i take like a five gallon bucket of old rusty wrenches and just pour it over your head (laughs) no you did not uh no no um let's see if i can get some do it aluminum yep titanium let's just say metal metal tweeters yep yep you got your soft dome yep a variety of materials like silk and polyester and then uh i don't know what else is there beryllium yeah i don't know what that is yeah i feel like it's on the periodic table of elements Probably. I wonder what that atomic weight of beryllium is. Do you know off the top of your head? How many, <laughs> no. How many valence no. neutrons are in beryllium? No. No. Now. I have no clue. <laughs> now. Now, Ron. <laughs> I teed it up. Now you go ahead and hit the ball down the fairway. Uh, that's what I'm good for. I can put the ball in the ground on the tee, and then you got to hit it. I don't even think that we need to really dig in much deeper than that. I mean, obviously there's going to be moving in the direction of different types of tweeters. And so this would be um, moving in the direction of um, ribbon tweeters, AMT, which is air motion tweeters. Uh, We could talk about planar magnetic, uh, planar tweeters. And The bottom line is this, that those are all different ways of skinning the audiophile cat. They all have pros, they all have cons, they all have strengths, they all have weaknesses. I can't say that there is one that is gonna be superior to the other. It could just come down to how is that tweeter being implemented to its kissing cousin, which is the woofer. And that would be through the use of a crossover. Have you ever kissed your cousin? (laughs) That was a bad. That was, I should not have, I went off road. I went. Yeah. I never have either, but there is a second cousin. I was pretty attractive. January Brookbank. She, she was cute. I, <laughs> nope. Just kidding. Oh, this took nope. a real bad left turn. So <laughs> why don't we talk about like generalities about specific types yeah. of tweeters. And yeah. obviously this is not applicable in every circumstance but if someone says hey ron i just got my new speaker and it has an aluminum dome tweeter in it what's the first thing that you think or first thing that most people would think bright bright okay bright horn horn tweeter titanium horn mounted tweeter shouty okay soft dome tweeter smooth uh amt tweeter I'm a bad person to ask. I'm right, a planar, bad planar rib, planar magnetic tweeter. Quick, quick to respond. All right, beryllium tweeter. Haven't spent much time with beryllium's. I can't say. All right, that's about it. That's all I have. I think perhaps maybe bright, 
but a different kind of bright than when we are talking about aluminum, maybe. So I will say this. Yeah. I'm trying to think which speaker it was. I think it was the Paradigm SE monitor. Okay, so I have two examples. Paradigm SE monitor, which was clear, but I wouldn't call it bright or fatiguing, and that had an aluminum dome. Yamo C93-2. Soft dome, but extremely clear and nearly fatiguing. Mm. And that was counterintuitive to what normally I would think about those types of tweeters. Yeah. How do they do that, Ron? Crossover. Sorcery? Uh, sorcery. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, for a long time, I the, the cliches that we just were drawing up, for a long time... I kind of fell into the camp of believing that that was the case, that this one is always going to be this. This one is always going to be that. Um, I don't feel that way anymore. I think that it just comes down to which specific tweeter are we talking about and which specific speaker are we talking about and what does that crossover look like? And no, that's not me avoiding the question or trying to dodge it. It's me telling you that it has been clear to me that it's not just as simple as saying all aluminum drivers are bright. It's just not that simple. They're all and garbage, there's a, Ron. They're all garbage. They're all S D is horrible. Yeah, and I think that a lot exact that's a that's a dang good one. Um I think that one thing that you and I both deal with is I think a lot of people want a quick and easy answer when it comes to well, which one is the good one or which one is the best one? And yeah. it's not that easy. It's far more complex than that. And so um, I have been I have been leaning more on my channel of, you know, obviously subjective listening and analyzing first, but then taking a look at the data that might help us understand what makes a tweeter bright. What is it that is actually happening? Why is it happening? And it's been interesting to see that, number one, bright is a lot lower than I ever thought that it would be. I've always been looking way up high, like 15, 20K. There's a rise up there. That means the tweeter is bright. Nonsense. No. Much lower. And it is almost always due to a poor integration on the crossover points, it is almost always a stored energy type situation, which we can briefly discuss. This would be um, something waterfall. negative. Yep, we'd see that in a waterfall. We would see that there is a frequency popping out of that tweeter that is just doing this the whole dang time as you're listening. And then pretty soon is you're like... function of the tweeter, function of the enclosure, it is. or function of the room, or all three? It would, in this example, if we're talking specifically about stored energy, it'd be a function of the tweeter. It means that there is a resonance, we'll just call it a resonance in there, that is poking out of that tweeter like a dagger. And it's saying, hey, look at me. And that's not good. It's not a good thing. Mm. I, w I would yeah, consider it a defect. Well, it's interesting because my hearing, for whatever reason, I'm very sensitive to specific frequencies. And it will get to the point where, you know, you, you hear about listening fatigue, but it, that's no joke for me. So if I, and I, there was a speaker I was talking to Ron about, there was a specific speaker that for whatever reason was hitting that frequency. And I had to like take a break for almost two full days. And I was still listening to music, but I had to listen to it very, very low because my ears and I almost felt like, I had, I don't know, like when you're a plane, on a plane, you get a little bit of pressure in your ears. Mm. It almost felt like that. And, and I, for whatever reason, I'm super sensitive to that. So when I start to hear that, I'm like, uh-oh, because I know what's coming. Um, and so it's always, it's always very refreshing when I hear a speaker that maintains detail and doesn't have the, that negative ear-piercing response and i'm not talking about the lobe of ear i'm talking about the eardrum 
anvil stapes stuff yeah. like that in your ear. Yeah. Hammer, anvil, yes. and stapes. That's from uh, yes. anatomy. I like that class so much I took it two semesters in a row. I'm just kidding. I didn't do well the first semester. No. I had to take it again this next semester. I I have no rebuttal to that. I have no I don't know. It's okay. The the university got more money from me. <laughs> This is where you talk, Ron. Okay, I'm going to save you. Yeah. Okay, was I digging myself a hole? No, you were great. No, I was just kidding. Oh. I tried to act like I froze. I was going to freak you out even more. Um, okay. just did because I was like, <laughs> am I still moving around? That's kind of mean, Ron. I know. I'm, it was I'm a well meanie. played, though. You got me. One of the things that I think that we should discuss before we move on from here is, so Somebody again, it had cables off the floor. Not quite. We're not quite ready for that craziness, um, which I've never done, by the way. Um, so bright and what we associate is bright is lower. And what I mean by that is lower in frequency than you might think that it is. Uh, much lower in frequency than you might think that it is. And so another thing that I've noticed since I have been looking at the data and exploring these things is there are times when what's... Yep. Don't keep us in suspense, Ron. Where is the bright levels? Or can you not say that? Is it proprietary? No, it's not. It's not. I would say that brightness can start as early as, I would say, even 1,500 and out to, let's just say, 6K. So there's kind of the anywhere within there, I would say you could end up with a bright sounding loudspeaker in any of those regions for sure. What does a bright sounding speaker sound like in a nutshell? I think that it sounds like my kids screaming. Oh, out yeah. in the living room when I'm Good trying analogy. to just, it's like, that's bright. That's, I should do an RTA on where my kids are screaming, whatever that frequency is. We need manufacturers to do a dip right there. Like just take that out. So when my kids scream, like I hear the echo. And when I hear the echo, that's when it's too loud. I'm like, All yeah, right, we're going to have to, we're going to have to figure this out because simmer this down. You're yeah. echoing into my happy place. Yeah. Um, what I was going to so, say is, yep. One more thing. Yes. So I, I use the term balanced, okay? Mm. And when I say the word balanced, I just mean if you go to a concert and you hear your favorite artist, maybe it's not even your favorite artist, you go to a concert, okay, this is what it sounded like. That's what the sound engineers wanted it to sound like. And... And logically, that's what the artist wanted it to sound like because they hired the sound engineers, right? Correct, we all, yes. We're agreeing with that, right? Yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. But then you go home, pull out a live album, same artist, put it in. I would think that if the speaker's balance is going to sound very similar to what you just experienced at the live concert. Is that accurate? I think that's fair to say. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I think so. Okay. A lot of times I just like to be validated by you, Ron. Yeah. No, I think that's that's a great way to try to unpack this for sure. Absolutely. Good job. Um, one of the things that I've seen, and this is interesting because you wouldn't expect it, is you have a woofer that is playing its frequencies, right? And it's going along, it's cruising along, and then the manufacturer, let's just say they have a first order crossover on it. So this is mm -hmm. going to be just a Inductive. slight yep, slight roll off of that woofer. Mm -hmm. and the woofer starts to drop, it starts to drop, it starts to drop and then right around 2k, what does that woofer do? It starts to go crazy. Ah. And the reason why it's doing that is because the manufacturer decided to do a first order on it when they probably should have done a second order if not more to increase to the slope to increase the slope slope so when it does crap the bed down the road it doesn't show up in the response 
And the example that I want to give to you is that what I have seen is wherever that breakup mode is, we see it lift. And guess what it lifts with it? The treble. The response of the, response of the tweeter. Mm -hmm. So it's we have a breakup sum, mode. Right? It adds together. We have the breakup mode that is now pushing this tweeter up. And in that example, um, it is a prime example of we can't blame the tweeter for what's going on here. And so in the right hands, that tweeter might have actually been just fine. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing is a poor implementation of the crossover. And the sum of that is, is a bright speaker and somebody that is listening at saying, this aluminum dome tweeter is bright when it's like, maybe not. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe it's not a poor crossover. Maybe they just didn't know what they were doing or they had to do it really fast. Sure. For, yeah. Number of different reasons. And I'm not trying to like, this isn't a specific example. It's just a, you know, an example. That's what I did on my speaker. Um, Oh, you, what did you, wait, what did you do? I did, implemented a poor crossover. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on just a second. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah, you're don't fine, look, dude. Don't look at the garbage behind it. I'm going to see if I can not knock everything off of this. This is, this is going to be entertaining watching. <laughs> I'm coming back. I'm back All right, buddy. There. You did it. Ooh, hold on. Let me solo you. Let me solo you. Hold on, hold on. Come on, there baby. We there. Oh. So we got, we've got three sand, three sand cast resistors. We have one electrolytic cap. We have one poly cap, and we have one inductor. Yeah. So. Do it. Oh, it's doing it. There you go. I think this All is right. the one that I was. I think I was reworking this one. Yeah. Reworking this one because there's no, yeah, I was reworking this one because there'd be another inductor on here for the because I did second orders on both, so there'd be another inductor on here for the uh, for the tweeter, cap for the high yeah. pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I used the the good capacitor on the tweeter, yep, and then the not as good capacitor. The electrolytic cap. Yeah. Okay. And we we actually often see that. So on a, can you fix your cable? It's making me crazy. The OCD in me is going bananas right now. I'm, it's like, <gasps> I'm, I'm, I can't do that better, Ron. <sighs> it's like I can breathe again. You might want to go see someone about that. <laughs> I wonder how long you would have left it there. That's what I want to know now. Like the I, entire I wasn't show, even aware of it. Um, I'm just going to be staring at this wire on your mic, well, I'm sure making me it made crazy. Horrible noises. It might be better, for, like for the happiness of your family, if you want to get that checked out. <laughs> I think I probably should. You have no idea. Anybody that sees my listening room, they're like, "Wow, we got a symmetry symmetry thing going on here. Everything is the same. It's got to be the same. It's yeah." I'm crazy. Yeah. Um, Sorry. I lost my choo-choo. What was I talking about? I don't know. I grabbed a crossover and started showing it into the camera. And then oh, we, we were talking about the lift perhaps oh, being yeah, yeah, one yeah. of the... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it um, just adds up, right? It does. Yeah. It's so the sum of got, it. If you got... So if, let's say your tweeter's flat at 1K, right? Yeah. And then your woofer is all of a sudden jumping up right down there then it's just going to push it up yes yes and so um let me ask you a question and i don't even know if yeah. you know this probably right, not so if we know this is happening right and we put a pretty mm -hmm. steep uh, slope on the woofer and mm -hmm. let's say we put a pretty steep slope and we even cross it over a bit higher than we would, would before mm -hmm. and then we just get a bigger dip is that mm -hmm. better because that even though you're going to have a dip, it'll still come back up a, a bit on the overall frequency. Would you rather have a slight dip at the crossover point than a bunch of craziness going on after the crossover point? That this is a wonderful question, and I'm glad you asked it because this is again something that I have called it. 
Here's the art of the crossover, right? It yes. There are Let me ask you this. Have you ever been in a situation where you're listening to a loudspeaker that is not bright and yet the tweeter continues to call attention to itself that you're you I it's as the if, wrong guy to ask that because i am just now starting to experience the speakers disappearing act okay thing, okay where that has been commonplace for you so i am okay. the wrong guy to ask about that fair enough so um when I reviewed the SVS Ultra, which was a fine speaker, I had no problems with it. One of the things that I noticed, and I saw this in the measurements, is that what you just described is not exactly what's happening with that speaker. The Klipsch RP600M is another example where we do see a drop before the rise of the tweeter. We do see that in the response, right? We see this is actually happening. And then somebody can say, whoa, that, that's a very detailed speaker. They could, yes. My walk away whenever I'm listening and I'm performing lots and I'm getting speakers out in the room, if I hear a tweeter that isn't bright, so we're not dealing with what would be potentially stored energy like the example we just gave, but I hear a tweeter, why am I hearing a tweeter? It has been my experience that it is less about what we are hearing and more about what we're not hearing. And what I mean by that is, if there is not a bridge that is going from that woofer to the tweeter and there is a drop, it's very easy for me to say, there's a tweeter right there. But it's because not a function a, of the tweeter, it's a function of the frequency. Response. Crossover, it is, yes. Sometimes it's both, but yes, you're right. That is that is the that is the point of this part of the conversation is that when you have that example that you just illustrated where we see that drop in the response before we see a rise in the tweeter, I find myself being very sensitive to the fact that I'm listening for this performance in the room and at all times there are two tweeters and it makes me crazy. And nine times out of 10, when I go to measure, what I see is a drop in the response and I see the tweeter isolated. And that explains, I think, why I'm always hearing that tweeter. When you go to the doctor to talk to them about your OCD, you might want to mention that too. I I should. I should. That it makes you crazy when you hear tweeters. <sighs> yeah. And they're, your doctor's going to, your therapist's going to be like, Can you what? Imagine? A tweeter. Like, what? Like a bird? Like, you he, Ron, you hear birds all the time? Like, Twitter. Can we talk about yeah. that? Social <laughs> yeah, <medias>. Twitter. <laughs> Sorry. No, you're fine, dude. Um, I don't necessarily want to dive too deep into crossovers. I'm probably not qualified to dig in very deep, but the bottom line is this, that based on the components being used in the crossover, we'll see a first order, a second order, and that is going to de determine the slope of the crossover of where the woofer meets the tweeter. Yeah. Um, you can get lost in crossovers, even from the different types of tolerances on capacitors and stuff sure. like that. Different sure. Types yes. Of inductors. Yes. All sorts um, of stuff. I suppose now is a good time to talk about, do you need, and this is, there is again, um, I would say, I would say a pretty good portion of audiophiles or hi-fi enthusiasts that would say, do you need a crossover? Is the purest form of a speaker playing no crossover? And this kind of goes back to wideband drivers. There are many wideband drivers that don't use a crossover. And for a very long time, this was touted as like the purest, most beautiful form of listening to a loudspeaker known to man is you're truly hearing. You're, nothing is in the way of the signal path. It is just the music to the speaker. Yeah, I will share. I so what, what, I'll back up. What what would you say to that right away? What would be your immediate gut reaction to that? I don't know. You can get to the store by rolling yourself on a log, but why don't you leverage some <laughs> of the technology that's been introduced in the form of internal combustion engines and drive yourself over there? <laughs> I mean, right? <laughs> that's the thing that jumps out at me. Why don't we use some of this technology that's been proven? <laughs> Oh my goodness sakes, that was great. I, um, 
Okay. That's the thing that jumps off the page to me. Right? Let's use a better enclosure. Let's everything that we've learned in the past 10 years, let's use it. Because you better have some perfect drivers if that's going to be the case. <coughs> perfect. Yes. Perfect. Um, one of my favorite speakers that I've reviewed ever is the Spatial Audio Sapphires. They measure extremely well. And the tweeter, that mid-range-ish tweeter that is being used is playing without a crossover disclaimer. There is a cap on there that is preventing the tweeter from blowing up. And if you measured it with and without the cap, you wouldn't see a change in the response. I've done it myself and you don't. Oh, I would say this. I agree with everything you just said. There are some exceptions to the rule. And um, in that particular example, the woofers have a second order on. So they have a steep slope second order. But the tweeter, which is made out of sapphire, corundum, very hard, stiff material, is literally playing without a crossover from 600-ish, 680 hertz, I think, all the way out no crossover. And when you hear that, it's pretty dang remarkable. And so again, we're kind of back to, it's not always that simple. Yes. I agree with you that, huh? What are the sapphires running like 299 a pair? 299 a pair. Yep. Um, they are, well, he offers the M three Sapphire, which is what I reviewed. And those are five thousand mm. um, dollars, and then he has the M five. I'm going to his website right now. M five. That's, that's a perfect like example of what we're talking about here, right? If you can get those perfect drivers, then the exotic materials that lend themselves to that type of frequent frequency response, yes, then you can get away with not using crossovers. That is, you just illustrated the point. That's it. Like, that is the biggest takeaway here is that there are times when you can get away with this. And when I reviewed that, I know that many people were waiting for the measurement saying, this is going to be a freaking disaster. There's no way that is going to measure well. And it ended up being one of, if not the best measuring loudspeakers in the history of New Record Day. Perfect following the horizontal plane. Perfect follow in the vertical plane. Squeaky clean spectral decay. I mean, it was astonishingly good. And when you hear that tweeter play, it is mind-bending that you're hearing everything that you might be sensitive to where you have that crossover point, like in the 2K region, when that's not there, it's crazy what you are able to hear in the music. You're like... Mm. I've been missing out on some really good stuff. It's pretty wild. Um, the M5 Sapphires are 3450. They have one. Yep. So they, the M3 and the M5. The M3 is two woofers, tweeter. M5 is woofer, tweeter combination. And they're, they're 3450 for the smaller for the smaller one, which I haven't reviewed, but I'm sure it's great. We're getting 40. We're almost 49 minutes into this, Ron. What else do okay. we need to talk about? Uh, we could move in the direction of, and I, I do actually want to talk a little bit about this. And um, Maybe we need to do two shows of speakers. Maybe we do. Maybe we do. I don't want to like, I don't want to gloss over important stuff just because we've been rambling on about Sapphire tweeters. Why don't we do this? Let's end with talking about waveguides and horns, the purpose of a waveguide and a horn. And then you guys let us know, should we continue this conversation in the next podcast podcast? Yeah. Does there need to be a part two? Well, of course people want to hear about woofers. We need, yeah. Line, we, port length roll on. Oh yeah. You know what? Is. We're going to have, we're going to have to do another, we're going to have to do a part two. You're right. So, I didn't, we, we haven't even talked about passive radiators, about ports, about the advantages, disadvantages. You're right. Enclosure size, enclosure materials. 
Baffle yeah. thickness, baffle step loss. Totally. Yeah, we'll we'll get all to that. Um waveguides, horns. Do you want to kick this off or do you want me to? Uh, I'll tell you what I know. Um tell, tell me what you know. Those items are used to try to make the frequency response more directional, which can lends it lend itself to sound staging and imaging. Is that right? Controlled directivity. Yeah. What did I say? You said that. You just didn't say. You said. I think you said that in a different way that was a little bit more elegant. <laughs> That's what I'm known for. My elegant. Cheap audio man. When known for elegance. The conference room. They're like, oh, there's Randy. This is going to get nice. And he's going to use some and therefores <laughs> and as well as all that good stuff. <laughs> Um, I got myself in trouble when I, I didn't get myself in trouble. Let's not be dramatic. There were some spirited comments when I talked about the RP 600 M as having a waveguide and not a horn. Boy, that really, that people got very excited about the, about that analysis. One of my viewers is <clears throat> worked in audio. Yeah. Ironically, he's also a submariner, uh, in the Navy. And he said the same thing. I actually posted something on my, con on my, uh, I don't know when you post stuff on YouTube instead of posting mm -hmm. a video. And he, he goes into a whole explanation of it. And his point was that a clip is actually a waveguide. Mm. So it's kind of counterintuitive, mm. counterintuitive. What we think is a waveguide Interesting. is actually a horn. What we think is a Horn is actually a waveguide. Anyway, I don't know if it really matters. It's just an exercise in semantics. It's so I, re I received a phone call and I don't think that he would mind me mentioning him by name in this. And actually, I want to have him on as a guest. But Mr. Jones called me and he started talking to me about those comments. And he said, that was interesting. And on one hand, you might not be wrong, but it doesn't mean that you're right. And so, again, what I quickly started to realize is this is going to be more complicated than what I thought. And so the term waveguide and horn in this day and age, it is a bit interchangeable. And it really doesn't matter what we call it. But one thing that is important to understand is when we start talking about the traditional sense of a horn-loaded speaker... The driver unit that was being used is a compression driver, and the purpose of the horn, based on the flange design, the design of the actual horn, is for projection. It is designed to make it as sensitive as possible. Reason being is, back then, they didn't have a gazillion watt amplifiers, and so they were trying to get the speaker to be as loud as possible to even be used in public address type situations which is why we would see horns used for those applications. That is not the purpose of a waveguide in all situations. A waveguide is about controlling the directivity in the vertical and horizontal planes. So the dispersion of that tweeter is physically being manipulated to say, I want you to beam in this type of a direction based on that waveguide is the bottom line i like it that's it good explanation simple as that so what's going on in eclipse and what's going on in i don't know elec unify ub52 same thing same thing it is it is just kind of trying to control where it goes horizontally and vertically yes just aiming it it's just aiming it Yes, and it's a big freaking deal because it helps with less than perfect rooms. It is, it is, it's helping you out with the best possible scenario if you don't have an ideal room because it's now beaming, it's forcing itself to go in certain directions, it's not being scattered all over the dang place. So, I would assume. With all that said, that if you have a specific type of waveguide, you may have a smaller sweet spot 
than if you have a different type of a waveguide because it's going to be less directive on certain speakers. I don't know for sure, but I believe that is definitely true. I think that is true. It makes, makes sense, sense to me. It's it makes sense to Maybe. me. I don't know. Logical. Yeah. Yep. So. What else? What else you got? <clears throat> um, we might as well, since we have just like what, 55 minutes in. Okay. Concentric drivers are interesting in that we have a tweeter in the middle, woofer on the outside. The woofer is the waveguide for the tweeter. But how does that, like when it's moving in and out though, because like a waveguide is static on most speakers, so now you have something moving in and out. So how is that affecting things? Andrew, help me. I don't know. No, oh, sorry. I put you on the spot. I don't know. And I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed to say, it. I don't know. That's too complex for me. That's going to get into Andrew territory or Danny territory of like, how does that work? Andrew would be the guy to ask because he is the expert on con concentric designs. Um, he makes them in his garage. He makes them. He makes them. Um, Where does he live at? Duluth? Hollywood, West Hollywood. Every day on Facebook, I see walking Wemo or WeHo, West Hollywood, and he, he takes pictures of flowers. <laughs> he just... Seems like a nice just man. Just a nice... I can just see Andrew just strolling along out there on his break from making some of the best speakers in the world. Flower. Hello, how are you? Hello, Rick. I'm Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Flower. <laughs> He's a cool gonna, guy. I was going to... Oh, there it is. I'm trying to find my phone. You guys know what Randy did? You guys want to hear a bonehead thing that Randy did? He either sold... I think you gave away or... You, you gave away your UB-52s. I did. Yeah. You should ask for them back. You should be like, no, hey... Oh, no. no. I, this was a gentleman who literally helped... He's done... I'm joking. He's done a lot for you. the ground. And he was... I, I initially, I'll bet he was blown away. I'll bet he was blown away. He was pretty happy. Initially, um, I was just going to send them to him for him to try out. And as I'm boxing them up, it just was, I just was like... You, you know, know what? And I took out a Sharpie. I wrote him a little note on the uh, on the thing that goes in there. Um, the directions. You wrote, you wrote on the speaker itself. No. Hey, I man. I, I, I wrote on the directions. <laughs> I was like, hey, man, thanks for everything. These are yours to keep. And then, like, That's cool. literally, I'm <laughs> driving away from UPS, and I'm just thinking, what? I just kind of gave away my reference speaker that all what other the? speakers are going to be judged against, and now I don't have that anymore. They're great. You know what I'm going to be? I'm going to be very interested to hear your thoughts. How do they stack up against the 350s? The UB-52s? Yeah. Well, I can already tell you that. I'm not going to. Uh, I mean, okay, with that said, I need to run the th 350s for a lot longer. Okay. Before before I make that statement. Because similar actually, Similar price point or the UB-52s a bit more? Yeah, 350s are $100 less than the, and then the UB-52s. Okay. Okay. Um, so there's that. Okay. There's that. But... With all that said, also, the UB-52s didn't come to life for a, a pretty long time for me. Um, so I'm basing, if I was basing initial impressions, I would, I would make, I would go one way. Um, and I haven't had enough time with the 350s to be able to say, yes, this is as good or it's not as good or whatever. Yeah. It's trying to find my, right, mean, my mean comment. Oh, yeah. I forgot about mean comments. Do you have one? I don't. Everybody's been nice this right. week. Oh. They really like the uh, uh, Kef review. So everybody's been nice. That was a fantastic review, man. Thanks, man. What do you got? What's your mean comment? Okay. This comes from Sam. Sam B. All right. You're reviewing great gear. But it's very difficult for me, in commas, to listen to your non-coherent descriptions. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
First of all, I think it's incoherent. Um, <laughs> not non-coherent. I don't know. Maybe hey, Sam B., my five-year-old wanted to remind you that it's... <laughs> now, don't be getting on Sam, all right? Because I, yeah. I typed things wrong before. And then my response, you ready for it? Mm. LOL, and that stands for laugh out loud, Ron. Uh, LOL, I don't think you're alone. <laughs> Ron agrees with you. That's at least one, you know, yeah. so... Yeah. How do you follow this? What is he talking about? You're like, I don't even know half of the things I'm saying. I I don't. Yeah. That's hilarious, man. I yeah. I had to screenshot it. That's a good it one. Friends. It's a good one. Yeah. No mean comments collected non from in our ramblings of a madman. <laughs> non coherent ramblings. <laughs> ah. All right, buddy. We're done here, folks. We will do another podcast next week. We're going to try to do these weekly. We actually have one bonus. waiting in the a bonus podcast. And what did we talk like about? A, the pan it was more like a, hey, we're talking about this anyway. Let's turn on the all the equipment around us and just chit chat about this because we kind of came at the it was the Drop Panda, the Bluetooth mm -hmm. headphones. Yep, we kind of came at it from. A little bit different angles and a little bit different backgrounds. Yeah. And it was just a great discussion about that product because we both have it at the same time. Yeah. Oh, and I will say, Ron, uh, that my seven-year-old's Bluetooth headphones ran out of juice, so I gave her the Pandas, mm -hmm. and she liked them, and she had no problem with their weight. My seven-year-old had no problem with the headphones. She could lift, she could, she could lift them above her head? Because no, that's where I struggle. I can get them up to about here, the and then podcast. I just <laughs> the panda podcast. You got to watch it, and then the... you'll understand what the what that inside joke means. <laughs> oh my goodness sake! Seven year old had Fun no times. complaints, and here we have Mr. Bernay. Mr. Bernay. Okay. All strange? right, Mr. Bernay. Uh, yeah, uh, Bernay Bruni. It is. French German, I think, is the origin. French German, Polish. You don't remember a little bit of this from the. Uh, I, I wasn't the around between then. Between two speakers. <laughs> Man, that was great. Like Rene, Rene, Rene. <laughs> we should do a round two at, at some point. We'll do a, a second interview. Well, now everybody knows that we're friends. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. Um, okay. This podcast is available on all of the major podcasting platforms. That includes Apple Podcasts. That includes Spotify and Google Podcasts. You can check out all the links down. We appreciate your support. We appreciate your viewership. Make sure you guys leave a thumbs up. That does help with the YouTube algorithms. And share the podcast. Yeah, Get it this out there. This podcast was brought to you by Randy's Crossovers. <laughs> You want to send me some money and I'll put together something that doesn't sound good at all. Randy's podcast. No, Randy's crossover. Crossover. On the podcast. Yeah. I love it. I love it. All right, man. We're done here. I appreciate it, everybody. And we'll see you guys in the next podcast.